Renal burst, part three. This rare condition is characterized by fibrosis of the skin, the joints, the eyes, and the internal organs. It's believed to be caused by exposure to gadolinium-based contrast agents in patients with renal impairment. In patients with renal impairment, gadolinium-based contrast agents can predispose to nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. This condition can involve fibrosis of the skin, the joints, the eyes, and the internal organs. Importantly, it occurs only in those with severe kidney disease, usually at a GFR less than 30. Also, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is unrelated to gender, race, or age. And for all you derm people at the microscopic level, NSF resembles scleromyx edema. All right. Hepatorenal syndrome will often present with a fena that is high or low. Which one is it, a high fena or a low fena in hepatorenal syndrome? In hepatorenal syndrome, the fena is usually less than 1%. So if a patient has hepatorenal syndrome and they present with an acute kidney injury, for example, the creatinine increases from maybe 1.5 to 2 at initial presentation, what's something you could do to determine if this creatinine rise was due to hepatorenal syndrome or prerenal azotemia. So you could give that person a liter or two of fluids. If the creatinine improves, it was probably prerenal, but if the creatinine stays the same or gets worse, it was likely hepatorenal. Next, you're seeing a patient with an acute elevated rise in creatinine and an ultrasound reveals hydronephrosis. What is the next best step in management? So what is your play gonna be when you see hydronephrosis, what are you thinking here? Urinary tract obstruction, right. So the next best step is bladder catheterization. And let's say you only get a few uh, cc's of urine back. So you should probably do what next? So you cath them, you only get a few cc's of uh, urine back. So you really need to do a nephrostomy tube right now, right? So you did a bladder catheterization, you got no return. So this tells you that you most likely have an acute obstruction of the upper urinary tract, not the lower, right? So acute obstruction of the upper urinary tract is usually treated by the insertion of a nephrostomy tube. Uh, in contrast, chronic upper urinary tract obstruction is typically treated by the insertion of a ureteric stent or a pyeloplasty, so ureter extent or pyeloplasty in chronic obstruction of the upper urinary tract. All right, name the two most common causes of renal artery stenosis. What are the two most common causes of renal artery stenosis? Number one, atherosclerosis, and number two, fibromuscular dysplasia, right, FMD. And you usually see that in young women, right? Now, for atherosclerotic renal artery disease, how does revascularization do compared to optimal medical therapy? So do you want to revascularize these people, i.e. put in a stent or do angioplasty? Well, it turns out that there may not be any benefit to revascularization. So uh, one study that looked at this is uh, the ASTRAL trial, uh, the primary outcome, renal function, and they did see a 0.02 milligram per deciliter uh, difference in the revascularized group compared to the me uh, medical group, uh, but the p-value here was 0.06, so it, it, there was a trend towards improvement with revascularization, but the bottom line was there was no significance. Now keep in mind, a p-value of 0.06, well, had that been 0.05, then, well, yeah, we would have said that, that there's a difference. So the p-value should not be a substitute for a brain, all right? Uh, let's look at the secondary outcomes. They did not see any significant difference in blood pressure, time to renal and major cardiovascular events, and mortality. So there are several other randomized control trials uh, looking into this. The coral study is another big one, so you can look that up yourself. But in summary, published randomized clinical trials provide little support for uh, the notion that angioplasty with stenting significantly improves blood pressure or it preserves the kidney function or reduces episodes of congestive heart failure in patients with atherosclerotic 
renal artery stenosis. So let's move on. What will the urinalysis show in acute interstitial nephritis or acute tubulo interstitial nephritis? So what's gonna, what's the typical UA look like? Acute interstitial nephritis, number one, white blood cells. Number two, leukocyte casts. And number three, eosinophils, but this is less than 40% of the time, at least less than 40%. Some, some quote about 23, 24, 25%. So urine eosinophils are not that sensitive or specific for that matter for acute interstitial nephritis. Now, how is acute interstitial nephritis due to allergic reaction gonna present? How will it present? So what clinical manifestations are you gonna see in acute interstitial nephritis? Number one, fever in about 27% of patients. Number two, a rash, only in about 15 to 20% of patients. Number three, you might see enlarged kidneys. And number four, occasionally the patient will have some dysuria. So acute interstitial nephritis, what are the causes? Most common causes of acute interstitial nephritis are what? Right, number one, drugs. So especially antibiotics such as penicillin, NSAIDs and the sulfas and number two infection infection can often cause an acute interstitial nephritis and that's it so thanks for joining hope this helps so long goodbye